Thanks. So it's on to our program. For a number of years, Mora Coast Audubon has been supporting this research on monitoring seabird nesting success by providing support such as scopes and office space to Sarah Snyder, who coordinated volunteers to carrying out the monitoring activities. When Sarah retired from this volunteer job, we were unable to recruit a new coordinator on a volunteer basis. So this year, we are experimenting with funding the position through Point Blue. I think you'll be interested to know that Point Blue is hiring Max Taylor for this position. Max is a young birder that Mora Coast Audubon Society has mentored over the past six or seven years, and we are thrilled to watch as he takes on leadership tasks within the birding community. We think this will be a great partnership between Max, Point Blue, and Mora Coast Audubon Society. And Max is here tonight. So, Max, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Max. Um, as Judy, Judy said, I'm going to be the new um, seabird surveying kind of coordinator. Um, I'm 17, a junior at Morbe High School, um, and I've had a, a love and like interest for the natural world for um, quite a long time, my whole life, really. Um, and then more recently, I've definitely gotten into like bird watching, maybe in the past like five years. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited for this new opportunity to uh, be able to like learn more about seabirds and surveying and then um also just be able to spend more time kind of focusing on the natural world and stuff so uh yeah that's kind of it i'm super excited great thank you max thank you so dan robinette is our speaker tonight he's the coastal program leader for point blue conservation science he studied marine bird response to environmental change for over 20 years he currently leads research and monitoring programs along the California coast, with much of his work focused on developing marine birds as indicators of ecosystem processes and condition. His research projects include investigating the diet and foraging habits of coastally breeding seabirds, marine bird use of coastal and nearshore habitats inside and outside of marine protected areas, the impacts of human disturbance on coastal habitat use by marine birds, and the impacts of dune restoration on shorebirds. All of this is going to be very important research as Moro, the Moro Bay area is being explored for wind farms, which are way offshore, but might be of particular interest to Dan. Okay, so Dan, you're on. Great, thank you so much, and and thank you for inviting me to to speak to Moro Coast. This is this is um, very exciting for me, and and welcome aboard, Max. Um, we're looking forward to to working with you. I'll be talking more about the the program that that Max is helping with um, at the end of the talk, um, and and inviting folks to to come join us and and do some monitoring along the coast this summer. Um, but first, I'll, I want to just introduce uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, we were founded in 1965 as Point Reyes Bird Observatory, or PRBO. So many of you might know that name. Um, and, and we've grown over the years and, and started developing birds as indicators of um, larger processes that are happening in, in the ecosystem. And so we, we've changed our name to Point Blue Conservation Science. We now have about 160 scientists. Um, we are still a, a science organization, so we are doing science. And we use that science with our partners, um, some of them uh, agencies, some of them land managers, some of them you know, even nonprofits like, like Audubon, um, to develop nature-based solutions to climate change, habitat loss, and, and just overall environmental threats to wildlife. Um, and our, our goal is to find ways to buy some time for wildlife to adapt to, to our, our rapidly changing planet. So that's that's our overall goal. Um, I lead the coastal program for Point Blue. Um, and as the name suggests, we work, work along the coast, uh, both on land, but also looking at near shore uh, ocean habitats. And, and our goal is really to guide the management and restoration of both coastal and near shore ecosystems by tracking responses of key indicator species. And, and specifically, we look at uh, shorebirds like the Western snowy plover and, and the black oyster catcher, as well as seabirds uh, like this pigeon guillemot and the um, pelagic cormorant here. And, and we have a number of key partners. Um, not everybody's listed here, but these are some of the, the, the partners that are really helping us with uh, 
um, using our science to manage these important habitats. Um, so tonight I wanna focus on seabirds. There's a lot of birds, a lot of di different species of birds, a lot, a lot of categories of birds that, that use the, the marine environment. Um, shorebirds, of course, we all know these guys, very charismatic, uh, oftentimes uh, probing in the sand, uh, looking for, for critters there. Uh, waterfowl, things like loons and ducks and, and scoters, uh, even marsh birds and, and, and raptors like uh, the peregrine falcon are, are part of the marine food web. And so we do consider these marine birds. But tonight I, I want to focus on this group here, the, the seabirds. And so I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about their life history characteristics that, that um, help us set them aside as, as a unique group of birds. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the, the seabirds that we see along uh, the central coast and the ones that we study um, and get into some of the threats. And, and I, I want to talk about success stories. Uh, we always hear threats, 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 and um, but there's but there's some hope. And I want to talk about some of that. And then finally, I want to talk about um, some of our work that, that Max is going to help us out with and, and see, see if we can recruit some volunteers tonight. So seabirds, why, why do we keep this? bird, this, this category of birds kind of unique from the other. Well, first, seabirds are very long lived. And perhaps the best example of this is, is wisdom. Wisdom is a Lazan albatross that uh, breeds out at Midway Atoll in the Pacific. Wisdom was banded in 1965. Um, and wisdom was banded as she was on a nest. And we know that that um, the earliest that Lazan albatross breed is five years old. So Wisdom was at least five years old in 1965. And uh, up until two years ago, she was still breeding. So she's at least 71 years old now and was success had successfully bred when she was 70. Um, now, the last two seasons, she's she's shown up at Midway. And, and from what I could see, uh, uh, she has not bred the last two seasons. Her mate, who, who was with her for 60 years, um, is not showing up at the island and, and she has not found another mate from, from what I'm seeing. But, but again, this is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily long lived bird. You know, thinking, think about being a successful breeder at 70 years old. So this is, this is a, a, a unique quality of seabirds. And the reason they are long lived is, is the ocean is highly variable from year to year. Oceanographic conditions change. We look at it at the ocean and, and, it seems pretty constant, but it's not. Uh, the The amount of food available can can change drastically from year to year. And so, here's one of three graphs. I promise I'm not going to show a lot of graphs tonight. But but this just this is um, looking at California least turn breeding population and reproductive success here on the Central Coast. The the orange is our estimate of how successful they were, so how many fledglings they produced in a year, and the blue is is what we call breeding effort, the number of adults. And you can see there, there's a lot of peaks and valleys, um, and so this really just illustrates the, the amount of uh, variability that we see in the ocean. And for seabirds, having this long-lived strategy means that sometimes you can opt not to breed. So when we look at uh, going from 2003 to 2004, we see a big drop in, in the reproductive effort. Um, not a lot of birds, in fact, zero birds came to the colony in 2004 to breed. The very next year, we, we saw a big jump again. This, this drop in 2004, that's not mortality. The birds didn't die. They just decided they're not gonna breed this year. And that's the long lived strategy you have. If you, if you live for a long time, you can wait these bad periods uh, out and, and then hopefully be successful in another year, another two years. Um, another strategy that seabirds has is, is that they raise fewer young, but they provide, provide more parental care. Um, typically seabirds, the, 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 you know, true seabirds like albatross, uh, they'll lay one egg in a year and they'll, they'll, uh, provide a lot of care for that, that egg. They'll, um, um, you know, long after the bird is, is fledged, they'll still be providing parental care. So that's another strategy that, that birds have. Um, seabirds have that that's different than than you know typical terrestrial birds. Um, now seabirds, we call them seabirds because they spend a lot of time out at sea, um, and in, in some species only come to land to breed. Um, and the reason that is is when seabirds are out at sea, they're for the most part top predators. There's nothing really. There there are not a lot of predators that are going after seabirds out at sea. 
But when they come to land to breed, then they become vulnerable to predators. And so, uh, again, a, a big part of their strategy is, is to, to spend less time on land where they're vulnerable to things like peregrine falcons, even things like coyotes, foxes, et cetera. Um, now, when they do come to land, one of their strategies to avoid being prey is to breed in isolated habitats. Um, oftentimes, they're on offshore uh, islands. So this is the Southeast Farallon Islands. This is the largest, um, has the largest breeding colonies of seabirds in the contiguous United States. So we have 11 species breeding out Southeast Farallon Island, over 250,000 birds breeding out there on an annual basis. Um, other islands in, off our coast include the Channel Islands, where we have a lot of seabird species uh, breeding there as well. Um, closer to shore, so when, when we're talking about the central coast here, um, offshore rocks are oftentimes used by, by uh, breeding seabirds. So here's a colony of Brant's cormorants off of Shell Beach. Um, and, and when you first look at the um, island here, you just see a bunch of specks. But if you get a spotting scope and look closer, you'll see... Um, um, you know, a few hundred Brant's cormorants nesting here on this offshore rock. Um, cliffs and uh, crevices. So here's a, a pelagic cormorant nesting on a cliff. Very hard for a thing like for, for animals like coyotes and foxes to get to these areas. Uh, crevices and burrows, again, just finding these tight spaces that, that um, predators really can't get to. Um, and so... I want to spend a little bit of time uh, introducing some of the species that we study here at Point Blue, the, the species that we focus on on the Central Coast. So these are definitely not all the seabirds that, that you can find on the Central Coast. Um, but these are, like I said, these are the ones that are, are of great interest to us. So the uh, Pigeon Guillemont, California least tern, which is an endangered species, uh, Western Gull, Ashy Storm Petrel, Pelagic Cormorant, and Brant's Cormorant. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on each of these just to kind of introduce you to these species. Uh, many of you have probably seen some of these species. Um, I'll start off with the, the pigeon guillemot here just because this is one of my favorites. This is a very charismatic species. Um, they have the bright red uh, legs here and when they when they open their their mouth the, the inside of their mouth is also very bright red. Um, these guys, you will see them along the central coast in the spring and summer. But then they're gone. Um, they're either out at sea or they've headed north um, up towards the Washington area. Um, when they are here, this is one of the species that breeds in these, these really isolated, hard to get to crevices. So this is a, a map of crevices that we monitored back when we had somebody who was uh, brave enough to do some, some repelling down this habitat for us. But this is at Point Arguello. And all these blue circles are crevices that we've mapped. And so we would go in there and, and check the contents of those crevices. Uh, but again, very, very difficult to get to. Um, coyotes, foxes, you know, uh, animals like that are not going to be able to get down and, and uh, eat the eggs and young of these guys. And so just to, to look up close, a very simple nest. You know, they're not bringing any nesting material. They're just in these crevices. Uh, these guys typically lay two eggs. So again, uh, very small clutch size and they provide a lot of parental care. And here's here's a young, uh, fluffy, newly hatched uh, pigeon guillemot. You can still see the, the egg tooth here on his bill. Um, another species that, that breeds in crevices um, that you're not going to see unless you're out on a boat is the uh, ashy storm petrel. This is an endemic species. It has a very... Um, a very narrow uh, breeding range, uh, mostly from from Northern California, just just north of, of San Francisco, down to the some of the northern islands of off of Baja, uh, Mexico. Um, this species uh, not only is it hard to find because it, it breeds in these these crevices, mostly on offshore rocks and islands, um, but it only comes in at night, and it only comes in at night on the new moon when it's pitch black. Um, again, a, a technique um, adaptation to to avoid predators. Um, so really, you know, unless um, you are out there with a research crew that's that's playing the the call of this bird and, and attracting it into mist nets, you're not going to see this bird unless you're out on a on a pelagic cruise and you see them out there foraging. Um, 
here's some here's a, a doll in a crevice again just very you know very small openings in these rocks hard for for other animals to get in there and, and take the eggs and young um these are related to uh, albatross so this is um uh part of the group of birds that we call tube noses because their their nostrils are are fused in a, a tube like this um so an, another just fascinating bird um it is threatened um it's not on the 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 um us threatened or endangered species list but it is a, it is a space species of concern because because it has such a uh, small breeding range and it is very vulnerable to things like oil spills um brant's cormorants this is a this is a uh easily spotted species along the the central coast here uh one of three cormorant species the one of the larger um of the species they have uh this this light tan cooler pouch and uh when they're when they're breeding uh they'll get bright blue in that that cooler pouch these guys like to breed uh either on really broad ledges or, or mostly we see them on offshore rocks. They've, they're very colonial, so they'll breed in groups of um, uh, a couple hundred. Um, and uh, again, here's here's that rock off of uh, Shell Beach that I was mentioning. If you look closely with the spotting scope, you'll see all these nests. They, they, they build pretty uh, large nests using uh, seaweeds and, and vegetation, mostly seaweeds. Um, this is typically how we see them breeding, but we will see them. This is at, at Vandenberg's Base Force Base. Um, we will, where, where you have these broad ledges along cliffs where you can get a, a big group of them coming in, we will see them breeding like this. Uh, but again, very colonial. Um, they like to, to pack themselves in and, and um, they get some protection from, from being colonial. Um, conversely, we have the pelagic cormorant, a much smaller cormorant that does is is very loosely colonial so they'll breed on on very narrow ledges um mostly isolated from from each other um and these are harder to find but you will see these on, along this central coast again especially at, at shell beach so here's an example of uh there's a hotel up here and uh if you take the the public path it kind of comes around and, and brings you to a vantage point that allows you to look uh, back up on the cliffs here and again, very, you know, you have, you have to look hard, get your, your binoculars out and your, if you have a spotting scope, but you can see them here, these little black dots along this cliff, those are all pelagic cormorant nests. So not as obvious as the, the Brant's cormorants, but, but um, um, once, you, once you kind of figure out where they are, they're, they're pretty easy to, to observe. Um, another endemic species, the, the Western gull, these guys are everywhere, right? They 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 find lots of different uh, places to breed, uh, but again, very few eggs. Um, usually two to four eggs. Um, so so not you know they again another species that's providing a lot of parent parental care, not not investing uh, a lot in in having a lot of uh, young. Um, very they they have very. Uh, some of the cutest chicks of all the seabird species, in my opinion. Uh, again, you can see a lot of these at, at um, Shell Beach, but but really any place where you have bluffs and, and cliffs, uh, Montana de Oriole, you'll see them breeding, uh, Estero Bluffs, um, um, lots, you know, just gotta keep your eye out for these guys. Um, and then finally, the, the California least turn, this is uh, endangered, uh, seabird it's on both the the federal and uh, state endangered species list um these guys are in danger because their habitat has been almost completely taken away from them so the habitat that they breed in is also the habitat where most Californians like to spend most of their time in the summer um so there's a very direct conflict with with the least turn and and um and the human population um, very simple nests. We call these scrapes because literally they just scrape in the sand. Their eggs are very cryptic, so hard to see. Um, when you get too close to them, they will get up off their nest. And now this nest is vulnerable. Uh, in the central coast, it's it's you know more vulnerable to wind, and, and the egg can get buried. When you get down into to Southern California, where where um, the summers are warmer, uh, these eggs can actually get super hot. If you've ever been on a Southern California beach. Uh, in the summer 
in, at noon or in the afternoon, you know, it's like you really need to have your your flip flops on to get across that sand because that sand could get super hot. And so that can uh, put these eggs at risk as well. Um, and the chicks also super cryptic. The adults um, will brood them for the first week or so or maybe maybe even less than a week. Uh, and then they're out foraging quite a bit. And so these chicks are are trying to blend in to the sand and and uh, avoid being detected by predators, which of course makes them vulnerable to to trampling, uh, especially when you get hundreds of people out on the beaches. They're not going to see a small chick like this, um, and and these chicks are going to get um, trampled easily. Um, so those those are the 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 species that we focus on here uh, along the central coast. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our research, and then I, I want to get into some of the threats that these birds face. So, um, in addition to monitoring these species to help them. Uh, especially in the case of, of birds like the, the California least tern, to help them recover, um, again, manage their habitats and ecosystems in a way that, that gives them time to adapt to the, the coming changes. Um, we also like to use these birds as indicators of what's going on in the ocean. Um, seabirds are highly visible, and um, oftentimes we can we can see what they're eating. We can do studies of both their diet and their foraging so we can see what they're eating, where they're getting it from. And this gives us some, some valuable information on their prey. So for example, cast and zocalates can tell us a lot about krill in the environment. Um, the California least tern can tell us a lot about uh, northern anchovies in the environment. Uh, pigeon guillemots, the ones that we study uh, here along the central coast, they eat a lot of juvenile sand abs. And so we've, we've uh, actually published uh, a paper using them as an indicator of recruitment for sand ebbs. And then a lot of the species along the coast are eating um, young of the year rockfish. So again, these guys can tell us a lot about the uh, number of young that are coming into the population. So they can help us understand recruitment in these, these fish populations. Um, and just to kind of give you an example of, of how this works. Um, so seabirds, Again, when they come to land to breed, they're, they're what we call central place forages. So here's a couple colonies um, uh, where seabird um, studies are being conducted. Cephi is Southeast Farallon Islands where Point Blue is doing uh, research. And then Anio Nuevo Island down here is uh, a group called Oikonos is, is looking at seabird populations down here. Um, these birds, because they have nests and, and eventually chicks, um, they have to return to these colonies multiple times throughout the day. So they'll leave the colony, go forage, and then they always have to come back. So, so it makes it easy for us to study um, what they're getting out of the, the marine environment because they're always coming back to this one place. Um, when we look at how fish populations are typically studied here, these red dots along these lines are, are um, sampling stations from the National Marine Fishery Service uh, trawl stations. And so you can see, you know, they, they try to spread these out as much as they can and, and sample multiple places. They're doing this because fish out there, uh, especially pelagic fish like young of the year rockfish and, and uh, northern anchovies, they're very patchily distributed. They're occurring in patches. So there's no guarantee that, you know, when you study along this line, you're going to hit all the patches. Um, but what... What we do know is that seabirds are going to hit those patches, right? Because seabirds need to find that food every day to survive and, and to feed their young. So these circles that we have here are three different species that have different foraging ranges. Uh, so the the dark, the, the solid yellow here is, is the pigeon guillemot. They're pretty much foraging very close to where uh, the, the colony is. Uh, if we look at rhinoceros auklets and other species, they We'll, they're going to forage a, a, a little bit farther out than, than the pill, pigeon guillemots, and then common murs are going to have a much wider range. And so if we use data from all three species, we can study fish abundance close to the colonies here at, at Cefi and, and Ana Nuevo. We can study fish abundance uh, a little bit farther out if we, if we look at rhinoceros oclids, and then we could also look even farther out um, by, by looking at, at common MERS. And when we combine those data with the, uh, the trawl data, that gives us a much better picture 
of what's happening out there than if we were just to look at the trawl data um, itself. And we've and we've published a few papers on this now, where we're um, adding the seabird data to the trawl data that that the fishery service is collecting just improves our ability to understand how environmental change is, is impacting these uh, fish populations. And it helps these managers regulate the fisheries a little bit better. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit now about the threats that seabirds are, are facing, especially along our coast. Um, there, there are numerous threats that seabirds uh, face, and, and luckily there's ways to deal with, with some of these, others uh, not so much, but um, you know, I do want to talk about some of the successes after we talk about the threats here. Um, but one of the main threats to seabirds and, and wildlife in general is, is habitat loss. The more that we develop habitat, the more at risk these species are, and, th and this is very true along the coast of California in general. We've lost a lot of habitat. Um, so I, we've talked about the, the California lease turn and how uh, the loss of that sandy beach habitat where these guys breed has is, is basically reduced the number of offspring that they can produce. And when you, re when you re reduce that reproductive output, then populations start to shrink over time. And that's what we've seen with, with the uh, California least turn. Similar story with the marbled murrelet. So this is a, a seabird that actually breeds in old growth forests. And, and as we know, we've, we've um, destroyed a lot of that old growth forest through, uh, um, through the lumber industry. And so again, when you destroy breeding habitat, that reduces the, uh, the, the, the reproductive output of these guys. And, and so over time, their, their populations start to shrink. Um, introduce predators. Uh, again, another way to re reduce reproductive output. Um, all islands throughout the world, for the most part, have had at least one shipwreck. Uh, and those, ship, those ships oftentimes are, are carrying things like mice, rats. And so these predators are introduced to these island systems where they didn't occur before. Um, and this could be devastating to seabird uh, reproductive output. Um, these guys are eating the eggs. They could even eat some of the chicks. Um, and so this is this is a major threat to, to seabirds throughout the world. Uh, fishing, uh, where we get a lot of, where we use gear that, that um, attracts seabirds and, and we get a lot of uh, uh, bycatch. So longline fishing is, is an example that, that was devastating to uh, albatross populations until we put in some measures to reduce the, the amount of uh, bycatch. I'll talk about the gillnet industry here in a little bit uh, as well. So, you know, these, these techniques that have um, lots and lots of bycatch can be devastating to these seabird populations. Uh, oil spills, another one, the, the more that we, uh, um, the more that, that oil is traveling on these large ships um, throughout our oceans, the, the higher, probability there is of, of a, a big accident. And we know just oil spills are devastating to seabird populations. Um, plastics and, and microplastics. Microplastics is, is uh, an emerging area of, of research. You know, as these plastics that have been around for decades now are breaking down into to really small bits, we don't really know the impact. We know the impact of some of these larger things. You know, hopefully all of us now, if we, if we are buying, um, six packs of sodas that still have these these plastic rings we're, we're cutting those right we all know that 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 wildlife gets in trained in them uh but we just we don't know the impacts of these these microplastics um and so this is an area of research that that um a lot of people are are looking into the ocean protection council um california's ocean protection council has in fact made that a priority area of research now um Organochlorides, PCPs, DDT, you know, even though we've banned DDT, uh, it's still out there in the environment. And so um, hopefully most of us know the story that, that you know, DDT causes uh, eggshell thinning. And so when these birds would incubate these, these eggs, uh, the eggs would break and you just, you have, uh, um, you know, overall reproductive failure in these species. So and again, we have, if you, aren't adding new offspring to, to a population, that population is going to start declining over time. And that's what happened to species like the brown pelican, uh, peregrine falcon, uh, bald eagle was another victim of this. 
Um, and then finally, climate change. Climate change is 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 the big one, right? There's there's many many impacts uh, that are happening from climate change. So we have breeding habitat is is at risk because of sea level rise. We have um, phenomena now that we call marine heat waves. So this is this map down here is from the the warm water blob that we saw in 2015, um, and and. Along our coast, where we, we typically have cold water, cold productive water, when we have warm water sitting on top of that cold productive water, uh, that has major impacts on, on prey populations. Um, and so that that works its way up through the food web to seabirds. And, and so when we see these types of uh, conditions off our coast, these warm water conditions, oftentimes we see um, very low reproductive success in our in our seabird populations. Uh, changes in upwelling. Again, upwelling is, is that process that brings that cold, nutrient-rich water to the surface where the phytoplankton can um, use the nutrients and, and do photosynthesis. Um, again, when, we, when we, we're, we're predicting changes in upwelling that are going to impact uh, marine food webs, and of course, that's going to impact our seabird populations. Ocean acidification. Um, can affect the the larval stages of, of many of the the prey species for seabirds. So again, it's you know there's there's a lot of risks coming at uh, coming our way from climate change. Some of them we can't do much about, but others we can. And and there's and there's things that we can do to mitigate some of these. So um, with that, I would like to focus on some of the su success stories. So. Um, I know most of us here are, are well aware of these threats, and and um, um, but I would like to to show that you know we have made some some um, positive impacts through our science, leading to mitigation and management and different policies. Um, the first one I want to highlight, and this is this is an old one, but but it's been so impactful which is the, the uh, banning of DDT in the U.S. in 1972. Uh, again, these species were, were uh, on the endangered species list because of DDT and the environment. And when we banned that DDT, these populations came back. And so all three of these, the, the California brown pelican, the peregrine falcon, and the bald eagle have been removed from the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so this is just, it's just a great story that, that shows when we identify a problem and we make some changes at the policy level, it can have a very positive impact and we can bring some of these species back uh, from the brink of extinction. Um, and even beyond just um, the, the banning of, of DDT in, in the US, like I said that, you know, DDT is still out there. Um, and so, um, Things like the the settlement against the Montrose Company. So Montrose dumped a bunch of this out off of um, the Palos Verdes Peninsula, um, and so they were sued for that. and And the um, the mitigation from that has funded a lot of again success stories. So uh, we've had uh, nest nest habitat restoration on Santa Barbara Island and in Santa Cruz Island uh, from that mitigation money. We've had feral cats eradicated from San Nicolas Island. Uh, and then even um, across the border down in, in Mexico, there's been restoration and, and monitoring and education that didn't occur down uh, at these islands off of Baja uh, prior to this settlement uh, money. So. So the, the success is continuing to, to occur. The benefits from, from these settlement um, programs is, you know, is continuing to help not just those species that we mentioned that were endangered, but, but uh, several other species that are breeding out on these islands. Um, gill nets, the banning of gill nets in California and now the phasing out of gill nets in, in the US is a huge victory for, for seabirds. So, Gill nets, uh, often referred to as walls of death. These are very indiscriminate ways of, of catching fish. Um, um, there's different kinds. They could be fixed in one location. They could be uh, drift gill nets that, that aren't uh, necessarily anchored down to the, to the seafloor. Um, they could be a mile, oftentimes two miles long. 
and and basically they're they're taking out not just the the fish that they're targeting but things like harbor porpoises common murs were were uh devastated by gill nets off of california and so um you know prior to 1997 it's estimated that about 70,000 common murs were taken out by gill nets um and so that prompted some changes so most california counties banned the use of gill nets uh, and then finally in 2018, so more recently, California banned the, the, the use of gill nets by boats docked at California ports. Um, and they also established a buyback program to, to help some of these fishing uh, communities that, that are obviously going to be hit by, by these bans. And then most recently, just in December of 2022, the U.S. passed the Drift Net Modernization and Bycatch Reduction Act. Um, it, it was a bipartisan uh, act, so introduced by, by Democrats and Republicans. It actually passed both uh, the House and the Senate in 2021, but was vetoed by, by the Trump administration. But it was reintroduced in 2022 and, and passed uh, both chambers again. And it was finally signed into law under the 2023 omnibus bill. So this is, again, going to continue to have very positive impacts on, on our seabird populations out there. Um, another act, now this one was introduced. Um, I don't think it has passed yet. I was trying to find more information on it uh, today just to, to try to follow it, but this is the Forest Fish Conservation Act. And even if it hasn't passed, I see this as a success because just the fact that we got a, a bill like this introduced into um, um, the US Congress is, very impressive to me because it's it's basically not looking at just you know direct impacts like things like gill net fishing but but we're looking to protect the prey base of of species like seabirds and marine mammals and, and even some of these larger predatory fish so um one of the things that this act is going to do if it's passed is it's going to give a science-based definition for what we refer to as forage fish right now it's it's too broad, um, or or not 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 so much too broad, but it's it's just not well defined, um, and so it's going to include things like krill that are at the base of of the food web and, and important to so many species. In addition to to species like northern anchovies and and young of the year rockfish, um, and then as we continue to to fish down food webs and start you know taking some of these these smaller organisms. There are more fisheries that are potentially going to open up, and so another thing that this bill, this act, does is it um, um, insists that uh, fisheries managers assess the impact of a new forage fishery on marine ecosystems prior to authorizing that that fishery, um, and I think that's that's huge. Just making sure that you understand the impact of a fishery before you open it up, and then finally, it's going to um, make sure that, that fisheries managers account for predator needs in existing management plans for forage fish. So in other words, making sure that we leave enough of these species in the ocean to support seabirds and marine mammals before we start taking, um, be, before we start taking any out. So there's, a, there's a, a level that we have to have in place. And then on top of that, the managers uh, will set their, their catch limits. So again, very, very progressive. And I think this is going to be huge uh, for seabirds. Um, and, and Point Blue is already working on this uh, at using our Farallon uh, seabird data to try to estimate how much forage we have to leave in the, in the ocean. What is that baseline uh, before we start you know, uh, fishing a, a particular species? Um, Another conservation victory in, in recent years is um, um, we are now cleared to start the eradication of mice out on Southeast Farallon Islands. So last year, the California Coastal Commission finally approved a plan to use rodenticide to eradicate mice out on Southeast Farallon Island. Uh, again, it was it's a, a controversial topic because we're talking about rodenticide and no, none of us really want to, to use that, but there's over, 60,000 mice out on that island and and they're they're having major impacts on the seabirds breeding out there and so um this is a case where where if it's done responsibly 
um, again, it's going to have a huge positive impact for these species. And then the final success story that I want to highlight, um, and it gets, us, it gets us back into some of the work that we're conducting here along the Central Coast, is, is the Marine Life Protection Act. So the Marine Life Protection Act was finally uh, completely enacted in 2012. It established 124 new marine protected areas along the coast of California. Um, and it's essentially protecting about 16% of state waters. Um, it is the largest network of MPAs in the nation. Um, and, it's, and it's setting an example for how we can um, use marine protected areas to, to manage our, our marine um, resources. Um, and in addition to, or, or as part of the 124 marine protected areas, California established 15 special closures. So these are areas that not only can you not fish, but you can't even bring your boat in there. And, and they're usually buffers of about 300 to 1,000 feet around um, seabird colonies, and uh, marine mammal haulouts. Um, so again, the idea is just to keep humans away and give these species some some um, space to to be productive in in their in their reproduction. Um, <clears throat> so when, oftentimes I get the question, well, how are MPAs? You know, an, an MPA is a tool to manage fishing. How is that going to have a benefit to, to seabirds? And so we look at MPAs as having both direct and indirect benefits. So we talked about fisheries bycatch. And, um, you know, the, one of the direct impacts of an MPA is if you stop fishing in an area, you're not going to have bycatch in that area. So um, we're, we're going to reduce fisheries bycatch by, by having um, these MPAs. And, you know, oftentimes we think about fisheries bycatch in terms of like the gill nets and the long lines and, and um, you know, maybe we've for the most part solved those problems, but there's still bycatch happening, even if it's just off a pier where, where people, you know, are fishing and, and a, a bird like this um, brown pelican gets gets hooked uh, or even, you know, some of the, the traps that, um, that the fishing community put out, especially baited traps that might attract birds in. So these are pelagic cormorants that have been caught in these uh, traps. These are stories we don't really hear about. These are things that are that are happening. And so if we regulate our, our fishing better, if we have these closed areas, we're gonna decrease these types of um, issues. Um, and then also we can decrease the disturbance to breeding and roosting sites. Again, if we're not fishing in these areas, especially in special closures where we're keeping people out altogether, you know, any reduction in activity in these areas is going to reduce that direct um, interaction between humans and, and wildlife. Um, and then finally, some indirect benefits include reduced competition for prey resources. And um, if we reduce that competition, oh, we're going to increase overall reproductive success in these species. Um, I want to focus a little bit on these uh, this issue of disturbance. So the special closures these were a big win in, in this process. Um, this one a good example here is we have some data at Devil Slide Rock, which is a, a, a rock just outside the Golden Gate, outside of San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is a rock where we get um, thousands of MERS breeding, uh, hundreds of Brant's cormorants breeding. Um, and, and we could see going up into 2009, there was, we're getting increases in uh, disturbance and mostly this was disturbance from from boats getting too close to the rock that special closure around devil slide rock went into place uh over the winter of 2009 2010 and then the impacts were seen right away these things work there was a, a major reduction in um in the amount of disturbance that we saw at this this rock here so um special closures work and it is important to reduce disturbance. I wanna talk a little bit about disturbance and why this is an important issue for seabirds. This is probably one of the areas that we can help seabirds the most along our coast. Um, it's 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 a somewhat easy problem to fix, I think, but we just need to educate the public. So what is what are we talking about when we talk about human caused disturbance? So here's a, here's a small boat. Um, here's a, a rock full of, uh, of cormorants here. The, ball, the boat gets a little bit too close. 
and all these birds flush into the water. Um, this is an example of human caused disturbance. These birds are just resting on this rock and then all of a sudden we force them back into the water. Um, we don't think about it, but but these birds are resting on this rock for a reason. They need to rest. Um, just like my dog needs to sleep all day. We think of it as lazy, but it's it's not. It's an important part of their life history, of their biology. Um, and in fact, some species like Brant's cormorants uh, and, and um, well, both, both species of cormorants and, and um, brown pelicans, um, they don't have very well-developed oil glands. Um, and so they don't have as much oil on their feathers as, as other birds. So when they get in the water, they're actually getting wet and they need to get up on these rocks to dry out. Um, otherwise they risk uh, hypothermia. So, so when we do this to seabirds, it's actually a, a pretty big deal that, that people don't really realize. Um, when we disturb seabirds on their breeding habitat, we can actually cause the abandonment of nests. So here's a nest over here. This is a pelagic cormorant nest that's been abandoned. And this happens when we get too much disturbance to an area. And in fact, for some species um, like cormorants, if there's consistent disturbance um, happening over a, a, a period of time, they might actually abandon that, that breeding area uh, permanently. So, you know, we can have abandonments of individual nests within a season, but if we get too much disturbance, if it's continuous disturbance, these birds might just stop using this area and, and go somewhere else. So disturbance can be a major problem to, to breeding seabirds. And like I mentioned, it's it's also not just to, to breeding seabirds, but it can be a major problem even to roosting to roosting seabirds that that need to both rest and also dry off um, as as part of their thermal regulation process. Um, and so, like I said, this is this is an issue that most people don't really think about. And and so this example, the 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 photo that that I keep showing of these birds flushing off a rock. This was actually this photo we took off of a, a website of a small tour boat that was operating out of Avila Beach here on the Central Coast. Um, and the caption by this picture read, you know, had a great time, had an amazing tour of the coast and even more fun racing over the swells with Captain Mike. Got really close to a raft of otters and crazy looking jellyfish. Then we checked out the cliffs and nesting cormorants. And you know, we were out there monitoring the, the cliffs and the nesting cormorants, and they would flush when these guys got too close. Um, but the point here is, is, you know, obviously this tour boat is trying to give a natural experience, get people closer to wildlife. I don't think that they realize the impact that they're having. Um, and in fact, we, we partnered with uh, California State Parks and um, a representative from state parks went and, and talked to this uh, boat operator and said, look, you know, this is this is what you're doing is, is having a major impact on these local birds. Um, and so the next year we saw a, a change in the, that boat driver's behavior and we saw a major reduction in the amount of disturbance happening at, at Shell Beach. So um, my point here is that, you know, people don't really know that that flushing birds off of a rock um, is bad, but we can educate them um, so that they know that, that, that that's you know, not a good thing and, and we will see changes in behavior. Um, again, getting back to this idea, seabirds are highly visible. So that makes them great for using them as tools to study the ocean, but it also makes them good educational tools. Um, and so these are they, you know, they're they're perfect for establishing community science. So getting the community out there to help us study these birds, and that information is 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 great for public outreach. So um, again, we've partnered with groups like uh, state parks, and they come out and and uh, educate um, the public about you know the life history of seabirds, but also the threats and and the importance of not disturbing them at their their nesting and roosting sites. Um, and when we get these community scientists out there helping us track the different types of disturbance that are, that are happening, we can then use that information to target that outreach effort. So here's Shell Beach. Um, and, and again, this is my last graph, I, I promise. Um, 
this is looking at sources of disturbance uh, over three years. And one, you could see that the sources can change from year to year. And so that's important for us to understand. Um, but it also allows us to you know, target the user groups. So um, one of the main sources of disturbance are here in this darker blue color, these are kayakers. And so um, knowing that is happening, um, again, can help us target that specific user group, either through signage or going to kayak shops and, and um, just having that target, targeted outreach and try to change, change their behavior. So with that, I do want to bring us back to, to Max, who we uh, were introduced to early on this tonight, um, and talk about a community science program that Morro Coast, Coast Audubon has been running since 2013. Um, and so citizens, we have uh, community scientists go out and collect data on seabird populations for us, but also record instances of human caused disturbance and help us track the, the different types of disturbance that are happening um, and, and compare disturbance rates among these different sites. So we go out to Shell Beach, we go out to Montana de Oro State Park, and we go out to Estero Bluff State Park. And uh, the community scientists go out there once a week they collect data on these birds and they record disturbances that they see. And uh, again, that that helps us when we uh, partner with folks like state parks um, and develop these outreach materials and, and try to reduce disturbance to these birds. Because it's it's another way that we can buy them some time to adapt to these changes that are coming with, with climate change. So if you're interested, if this sounds like fun, and it, it is a lot of fun, it's a great way to just get out and, and explore the, the Central Coast. I encourage you to, to contact Max, and his email here is uh, mwilmoretaylor at gmail.com. And also uh, contact my colleague, Julie Hauer, who's working with Max on this program. And you can email her at jhauer at pointblue.org. Um, I'd encourage you to email both of them and, and one of them will get back to you. And, and we're gonna have some training here coming up in March. So um, please get on our list and um, come out and help us study these birds. And with that, I just wanna thank all our partners that have helped us both with just funding and with uh, using our data to, to manage our coastal resources. Um, and of course, all of our staff and interns and volunteers at, at Point Blue. Um, it's truly a team effort and, and um, we wouldn't be able to have the impact that we do without all these partners and, and um, colleagues. So with that, I think we have some time for questions. Um, so I'd like to open it up for questions. Great, so I'm gonna start out, we have questions that people have put in the chat. Okay. Uh, you answered one was was my question about uh, the proposal to poison the mice on Farallon Islands, and uh, I mean I've I've been had people come at me from both sides of that argument. You know we're going to poison the burrowing owls that are coming out, but if we don't uh, get rid of these mice, um, the city petrels are in danger. And I saw videos of the mice; it looked like popcorn. At yeah. night. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> yeah. It is it's very controversial. And you know, I don't use any types of pesticides or or rodenticide or anything around my house. I, I am very sensitive to that. Um it, it's it's a tough one. And and so um, but it's important to realize that they're not just, you know, throwing this stuff out there and um they are taking the other species um they're doing what they can to to make sure that those other species don't encounter the these rodenticides. So you know whether it's flushing gulls out of the area, or um, I, I don't know the details for this specific project, but but you know they are doing as much as they can to make sure that that you don't have that. Um, I guess I would call it bycatch of of rodenticide. You know, trying to try to keep it away from all the other species and really just target the mice with it. Right. So another question, this is also mine. Um, it like <laughs> we, I, I got on there first. It sounds like we should be contacting our representatives on the Forage Fish Conservation Act again. Then. Yes. And, and, I, and I, I 
meant to mention this. This was actually, this is something that Audubon California has really pushed. So Audubon has actually been a very, um, has has really led the charge with this. And, and then you, you guys have a chapter down in San Diego who's, who's also gone to um, some of the Pacific Fisheries Council meetings and and work with them directly to try to get, you know, forage fish considered. And, and there's there's action happening even outside of this legislation. But but absolutely, I would I would, you know, contact your um, representatives at the federal level and, and say, I want this thing passed. Great. Um, we have a thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And uh, Lucio Bosco says these strides sound wonderful, but what's the follow-up that these protections, what is the follow-up that these protections are happening? Um, Do you mean science-wise? Like, are we monitoring to see if they're having an impact or? I'm not sure. She, she then goes on to say, oh, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Nothing happens to the humans who are disturbing the salmon on the central coast. Um, so I'm not quite sure. Well, when, when we're talking about disturbance and I'll, I'll bring it back to seabirds, I'm not sure about uh, salmon disturbance, but, but, but for seabirds, it's, you know, we do have the, the migratory bird protection act that gives some protection to birds. Um, but they're really, it doesn't have a lot of teeth. Um, and it's it's really it's it's just something that's hard to there's not there's not a lot of laws out there I guess I would say for the to start with and then the laws that are out there it's hard to you know prosecute give a ticket whatever I think the best way really for disturbance issues is is through education and just letting people understand that that you know when you flush a bunch of birds off of a, a rock you're you're making their life hard and you can increase stress and increased stress is going to lead to um poor health and maybe even vulnerability to disease there's there's all these you know issues that come with it um i i really do think that that's the best way to to deal with disturbance because it's happening up and down the coast so even if we had law enforcement that could you know give somebody a ticket when they see them um um, disturbing a bunch of birds. Um, I just don't know that that's going to be as impactful as if you just educate them and, and get them to want to change their behaviors. Yeah. So there's a question about the wind structures, the windmills that are being proposed by Balm uh, off Mora Bay. Do you, do you have, does, are those far enough out that they're not going to be impacting these particular seabirds? that you know of? Are you concerned about those? I know there's two proposals of Vandenberg that are actually are not very far off. Yeah, so the Vandenberg ones are in state waters. And so they're not going through Boehm. And I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the status of those are other than I, you know, the, so we, we do a lot of our work here is at Vandenberg Space Force Space. Um, and we're, we're contracted to, to monitor the birds out here. Um, so just conversations I've had with resource managers, I don't think that the companies have actually even talked to Vandenberg, which they're going to have to go through Vandenberg with their power lines. Um, that's just hearsay, but um, so I don't, I don't know if and when those projects are going to go through. Um, my understanding is I don't, I, I believe the Moro Coast, well, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I want to make sure I'm not giving out bad information, but um, I mean, I think in general, the wind, um, the offshore wind energy, it's, we know that there's potential impact for birds. Um, and so, you know, we need to try to guide the process to understand where those hot spots are for, for these pelagic birds um, and try to make sure, you know, minimize that overlap with, with um, the wind farms and, and these hot, you know, any hot spots that we can um, detect with, with offshore seabirds. Um, yeah, in terms, in terms of the species, with, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say in the terms of the species that we're studying, um, 
most of them are staying near shore. Um, you know, ashy storm petrels are obviously going far offshore, farther offshore, um, and, and are going to be vulnerable to things like that. Um, pelagic cormorants and, and Brant's cormorants um, probably staying um, closer to shore than, than the, the wind farms. Um, so, but I, I think it is, it's a big, um, it's a big question that's still out there. You know, what are the impacts going to be? Right. The, the National Audubon, Gary George, has been very engaged in the wind farms. And, and Moore Coast Audubon has been in conversations with him and a group of local environmental organizations on the wind farms. There's one lease in particular off Morro Bay that was withdrawn because of concerns specifically over birds. Right. So right. Moore Coast Audubon is monitoring the situation pretty carefully. Yeah. And I think, again, that's where action comes right so groups like Morro Coast Audubon taking the scientific data and then advocating for these these um protections and making sure that those conversations are being had right so uh there is uh concern also about uh the storms we've been having recently high winds um torrential rains we haven't entered breeding sea or nesting season yet on on the shorebirds is that true um well sh so shorebirds so you know snowy float western snowy plover, not sure. yeah um are that that season starts next week essentially may march 1st is when we start monitoring for those guys um i will say that from what we've seen a lot of the beach has been eroded because of these storms so it will be interesting to see um, what impact that has on on snowy plovers this year. Uh, but but you're correct. The other the other seabirds, the seabirds that I've been mentioning in in this um, talk have not started breeding yet. Um, I I think the you know they're not going. We you know we haven't seen habitat loss necessarily that's going to affect them for for the least turns at least here at at Vandenberg. They're breeding high up, so so they're not right on the beach. So they're not going to be um, impacted by the beach loss that the the plovers are going to be impacted by. Um, and so I think for them it, it it'll be you know we we tend to look at more of the oceanographic conditions in terms of upwelling and ocean productivity and how's that going to affect their prey base um and so that's those are usually the the impacts that we see to these seabirds is is you know things that are impacting their prey base will then impact their reproductive success that year okay so i'm not seeing any more questions if you have more questions type them into the chat but uh i really want to thank you dan this has been very informative oh thank uh, you thank you i've really in uh, appreciated it. Um, I'm getting another question. Is it possible that marine life near the wind farms will actually attract birds, thereby increasing the danger to the birds? That That is a hypothesis that's out there as well. So, you know, these structures uh, can act as reefs. So similar to, you know, oil rigs act as reefs. And so you start getting these, these communities that are forming around this, this reef. And so will that attract um, birds to to prey on that that community um that is a very good question and i i don't know the the answer to that one honestly okay uh is there any study of water quality in the Morro bay estuary on this is on shore birds but i think it could also be a question about about the seabirds um i'm not familiar with with um what's happening in the estuary um we don't we don't have any studies in the estuary currently point blue doesn't so i'm i'm not familiar with that area um most the the seabirds that we study are are actually not in the estuary although there is uh over by the uh the natural history museum over in that area you know those eucalyptus groves do support um breeding double crested cormorants um, but aside from them, you know, the, the birds that we're studying are out along the coast, along, you know, breeding on cliffs and, and offshore rocks. So they're not up in the estuary. So um, I'm not sure who the best contact would be for, for looking into water quality issues in Morro Bay. You know, the NEP might ha have a line on that, actually. 
Um, there's one more question. Would you guess that wind farms would affect mostly migrating seabirds and some very pelagic hunters like albatross? Or is that an unknown at this point? Um, yes, I think I think definitely. And and folks have have looked at this, you know, flight behavior is definitely something to consider when when looking at whether a species is going to be vulnerable to these wind farms. Um, again, it's not something it's not research that I'm in, involved with, but but I would, you know, definitely agree that you know species like albatross that are that are more likely to be higher up in the air and and um um cruising through these areas a little bit farther offshore absolutely they're going to be more vulnerable um um but again it's it's not my area of expertise so i wouldn't be able to like give you a list of which birds would be vulnerable to these these right. um wind farms right okay thank you and that takes care of the questions. So I'm going to make another plug again for uh, volunteers. If there are anybody volunteers, you go out, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie and Dan, you go out in teams of at least two so that somebody's got a spotting scope, somebody's taking notes. Sometimes there's an, a third person. Um, and it's not like you have to go out every weekend. Correct. There's a calendar <laughs> that's set up so that you can choose which are the dates that you're available. If we have enough volunteers, we can fill in all the dates. Yes, absolutely. I I think teams of two are great. Um, it certainly has been done as a team of one, but it does make it more difficult for uh, making observations and, and collecting the data, um, especially if you're more of a beginner when it comes to, to data collecting and, and making observations. Um, we welcome all levels of experience. Um, and again, yeah, teaming up is is great. And um, we do so we we try to get the the surveys done once a week, but it's not a once a week commitment. So if we have plenty of volunteers, you know, it could be as little as once a month, um, and maybe maybe less depending on on again how quickly the calendar fills up. It doesn't have to be weekends; it can be weekends. Um, but if you are available during the week. Um, we welcome that as well. So um, if if it sounds of interest to you, don't let your experience talk you out of it. And um, and we're definitely willing to work with, with schedules. Um, so please contact Max and Julie if you're interested. And Max and Julie are going to be doing training of the volunteers. So if you've never done this before, you're not quite sure what it involves. They're going to take you out on site to the different areas and show you what what are you, where are the locations and what it is is expected of you. And there's also training in the office. If you're not sure, you can tell the difference between a pelagic cormorant and a branch cormorant. So, you know, Max is going to, and Julia will be in charge of, of helping you learn the distinction between those species. So I really hope people get involved. It's, it's a wonderful process. It's a wonderful program. So and I have one, I have two more questions. I'm sorry. Sure. Oh, bring them, <laughs> bring them. It's like the, the wind farms are, are a big sort of thing. And so one person is saying, um, she's actually out of Bend, Oregon, saying you know, there's a lot of interest. Um, no, we don't have any legislators present at this, at this particular one. Um, yes, we should invite them to these presentations. And it would probably be worthwhile inviting Gary George or a or someone else to do a presentation on the wind farms. Yes, absolutely. Off of off of uh, the Moore Bay area. And, and then Kathy and Lynch wants to know, does Point Blue have a data set for seabird migration timing and numbers? And if it's not Point Blue that has that, is there someone who is providing baseline data for wind farm locations offshore Moore Bay? I don't know the answer to that. Gary George probably does, if you don't. We, yeah, so, so, I mean, there's, there's multiple data sets out there and, and we've done prior, prior to the, the, the wind farm being considered off our coast, we, you know, uh, Point Blue, we being Point Blue, I was, I was not part of this uh, effort, but um, we've done modeling where we take those data and, and look at hotspots up and down the coast. So hotspots being areas where 
seabirds tend to con congregate. Um, and, and, and those are at sea surveys. So looking at both migratory birds, um, so things like uh, sooty shearwaters that are, you know, coming up from um, the New Zealand area and, and hanging out in, in the summer and fall, but also just birds that are that are off the shore foraging, you know, locally breeding birds like ashy storm petrels. Um, so the, the data are out there. there we, oftentimes you have to piece them together from different sources. There's not a single um, survey that goes up and down our coast and, and captures everything, but there's there's groups doing smaller pieces of the coast and we can oftentimes piece those data to, those data sets together. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, well, that is uh, everything that I am seeing. Dan, thank you so much. Julie, thank you for being here. And Max, thank you for being here. So much appreciated.